Hey, it's Greg Rand from Renters Warehouse. We're about to get started doing our Facebook Live show, Picking Winners, where people call from around the country, ask me questions. I know only one thing, and that's real estate markets and real estate investing. So we throw some data up on the screen, do some visualization, bulletproof their investment plans, and answer their questions. So hope you enjoy it, and join us on uh, Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Renters Warehouse page on Facebook. Hello and happy Friday. Welcome to Picking Winners Live. My name is Greg Rand. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Renters Warehouse. We are America's leading real estate investment company. Very proud to be here. Um, we always have this live on Friday afternoons because I'm hoping to have you associate your Good Friday mood with me. So I'm cheating a little bit, trying to get you in a good vibe and talk about your future, talk about your passion for real estate investing. Um, a little bit about my background, and then we're going to get to your questions. If you do have a question, uh, do me a favor, put it in the comments. But really, all you really need to do is um, give us your name, your first name, and your phone number. And in a very Gary Vaynerchuk style, we're going to call you, put you on speaker. You can ask me the question live. We'll go back and forth. I'll try to do the best I can to uh, give you some valuable information. Um, and uh, let me tell you who I am and what I do so that you know that it actually is valuable information. My uh, my career has been in real estate investing, not just doing it myself, but doing it for a lot of other people. That's really where I learned the most, to be honest. I've got my own portfolio, but I've been involved in literally tens of thousands of investment decisions by uh, large commercial investors in New York, where I first learned in my, uh, in my younger days, and then in the last 10 years working with Wall Street firms and other professional investors who were gathering up and building massive portfolios of single family rental homes, SFR. That's our, our sweet spot. So um, a lot of what I know we can relate to commercial real estate, so feel free to j dive in and, and talk about that because the principles are kind of universal. But what you'll find uh, about single family homes as rentals is that they're special because the barrier to entry is the lowest, right? You don't have to buy a building, you can buy one house. There are places in this country you could buy a house for under 50 grand. There's a lot of places you can buy a house for under 150 grand, and the financing is readily available. Um, and so people know houses, right? You probably grew up in one, you might live in one now, so there's a familiarity with it. And it's like one house, one tenant. There's a simplicity to it. Um, and the reason why most people don't do it is that it's a pain in the neck. All right, if you own 10 houses, they're in 10 different locations. It's a pain, it's wrought with hassles, unless you hire America's leading property management company to do all the dirty work for you. So that's what we do. Um, background on that is that Renters Warehouse is about a 10 year old company. I just joined them. Uh, they grew to be the biggest property management company in single family real estate nationwide. We've got uh, 40 offices around the country in different states. And um, uh, they bought my company. In January, my company was called Own America, and Own America was an online platform for professional real estate investors who were buying and selling portfolios or collections of single family rental homes. And so my clients were Wall Street firms and large professional investors, you know, companies that have literally thousands of homes and individuals that have dozens of homes and making transactions happen between them. And then uh, we got together, Renders Warehouse and, and us, and envisioned this concept. <clears throat> um, which is actually a 10-year-old or 20-year-old vision for me, but realizing this vision of a national brand for real estate investors, right? Why isn't there one? Why are there 15 real estate brands to buy homes from? There's 15 real estate brands to buy commercial real estate from. There's 15 brands to buy stocks and mutual funds and insurance policies from, but there's no brand dedicated to you. People who I'm guessing if you're here, you're a real estate junkie, you might be brand new to it or you might be experienced, but uh, whether you're getting into it now or you are very experienced, you know the following. Nobody's out there to help you, right? There's never been an industry or a company formed around your needs. So you wind up working with websites that are awesome for home buyers like Zillow and Truly or Realtor.com and whoever else, but they're not geared towards investors. You wind up working with real estate brokers who are wonderful people, but they don't know anything like they still think a yield is that triangular sign that means that other guy goes next at the, at the intersection, right? They don't know anything about yield. They can't really tell you anything except for it's a good investment. And so there's a big gap is the point. There's a big gap in the universe here and we're filling it and we're excited to be doing it. 
because we have a lot of passion um, for helping individuals realize big, audacious, long-term financial goals because we know something that I think a lot of people know intuitively, which is the best way to accomplish long-term financial peace of mind, freedom, abundance is to accumulate a portfolio of American real estate, period. All right, if there's any stock jocks out there that wanna argue that, please bring it on. The only reason why anybody invests in the stock market is because nobody's ever illuminated the true ROI of single family homes. And now that we're doing that, and we handle the management, it's hassle free, it's foolproof. And when I say real estate investing is foolproof, if you do it right, if you do it where you buy responsibly, you buy quality, right? Don't buy junky houses that need to be massively fixed up. There's people that do that, I don't do that. My hands are so soft that when I hold babies, I get chafed, not them, okay? So I'm not about to go out and start renovating houses, right? I buy the nicest house I can in the market that I've chosen. And my specialty has always been looking at the big picture of um, where people are moving, why they're moving there, are those things gonna continue, why people stay places, are jobs moving there, what are the drivers of demand they're gonna give one part of the country and then one state and then one market and then one town within that market and even maybe one part of town. What's gonna to give that extra elevation in terms of demand? Because elevated demand, basic supply and demand. If elevated demand comes, then you're gonna see your rents increase, which means your profit, your, your yield is gonna increase and stay stable. And the value of your property is gonna increase over time. And if you give it time, you don't lose. So real estate is a foolproof investment if you do it right. And um, if you put all your money in the stock market, well then I can't help you. So <clears throat> we have any questions piling in yet? Nobody yet? Nobody yet. All right, come on, put your questions in. Give me your name, your phone number, and a brief idea of what your question is. I'm gonna start with a question that we got last week that I didn't get to, because we pulled the plug um, right before I saw it. And, um, and it was about Pittsburgh. This is somebody who is uh, from Pennsylvania. And so he kind of wants to invest close to home. He's right in between Philly and Pittsburgh, but he was kind of asking, should I go Philly, should I go Pittsburgh? And I said, I like Pittsburgh. This is something called the Research Center on RentersWarehouse.com. Now what you're gonna see now is some pretty cool stuff. Think of this as a real estate video game, all right? If you're a real estate enthusiast, you're gonna find this stuff to be a lot of fun. And we, over the years, in working with all these large Wall Street firms and professional investors, we, um, we gained mastery over big data around housing. I'll give you an example of some of the things that we cut our teeth on that got us a reputation on Wall Street, and that was that when the housing crisis was underway, um, we started this company not to go and like capitalize on the bones of all that misery. That wasn't, and I'm not casting dispersions on anybody who did, but that wasn't our instinct. Our instinct was not, let's go buy up a bunch of foreclosures. Our instinct was, there's a housing crisis, and by the way, you can see it right here on this chart. See this chart? This is the last 20 years, 1996, 2005, 2006. Here's the big boom, here's the big meltdown, and here's the recovery. All right, so this kind of gives you perspective. If you think about all the news stories you read over the years and heard about the housing crisis of 2008, that's it right here, okay? So yeah, it went down. But don't let anybody tell you that this happens all the time. This happened one time since the Great Depression, and it was because we went slap happy in uh, the lending business, giving blank checks to people. They spent money they didn't have. They drove prices up. The market didn't have any of that, and the market corrected and went back to, if you look at this line, by the way, the reason why it's choppy is that it's monthly. But if you look at the, the smoothing out of the line, you can see that the market kind of like got back to where it wanted to be, okay? Um, that's the US, and right around here, we said, okay, we're gonna start this company we've been dreaming about, uh, a real estate investment company, because right now, it is clear that nobody understands the housing market. So, the government doesn't understand it, they're the ones that push lending standards. Uh, the lenders didn't understand it, because they're the ones that allowed themselves to get pushed. Realtors were passengers on that train, they were making money hand over fist, didn't have a care in the world, um, and the consumer, lost their heads on this. You know, people that had a blank check in their pocket for 400 grand, they were planning to buy a house for 225, but then they got a blank check for 400, so they went out and spent 400. They couldn't afford it, things went bad. So we started the company here, and um, we were right. Our, our, our thesis was, 
there's going to be an investment boom on this other side of this, and there's no real estate company, no real estate portal that's going to enable that and thereby build a business, a big business around it. We were right. Okay, big investment boom ensued. Um, and our original thesis was, let me find a school district. Because you think about the people. The, the key to picking winning markets in real estate is understanding people, where they're going, are they staying, and why. And if all the why is still intact, you're, the common sense associated with picking winners is really uncanny, and then you back it up with data, and it informs your opinion. Our original thesis was, let's go to school districts. Because if I think about a family who's losing their home to foreclosure, they have a lot of stress on them, and there are two things they're stressed out about. One is this financial mistake they made they want to get out from under, so they're going to give the keys back to the bank or do a short sale, but they're going to get out. They're in distress. They can't keep the house. Right behind that is their second concern, which is how do I shield my kids from the impact of this? And the answer to that is keep them in the same classroom. That's it. That's what they're concerned about. We can move neighborhoods. We can change houses. They can go back to sharing a room. No big deal. But they need to be able to go to the same classroom. Different bus stop, same classroom, right? That's what was on people's mind. I knew it. We confirmed it. So we started running data sets and analysis to try to figure out where were the school districts where there were way too many foreclosure filings and way too few rentals, right? We found routinely five to one. So there were five families in some stage of facing foreclosure for every currently available rental on the market. That meant if you bought more rentals in that part of town, you'd have ready tenants and they probably bid up your rent. When you have five families that need a rental, you only have three rentals, you can get 40 bucks a month more in rent. And when you get 40 bucks a more, month more in rent, you're not gouging, it's supply and demand, but your yield goes up, everything works out well. That's what made us famous inside of the Wall Street world of investing in single family because everybody else was chasing beat up junker properties wherever they happened to be. We were following the demand. That kicked off our, our careers of representing and advising Wall Street firms on where to buy and then of course we helped them buy and we helped them accumulate these large national portfolios. Um, so now along the way we realized that hey we've got mastery around this data Everybody should have this. And so we took all the data sets that we already owned, bought a whole bunch more, and built the research center and the Renner's Warehouse Investor Marketplace. So what you're looking at right now is, is to me, the money chart. Okay, literally, actually. But I mean figuratively. Like, this is, this is where it all starts. This is the thing that's the most important. How did the market perform over the last 20 years in terms of price appreciation? This is not some Case-Shiller Index um, algorithm nonsense. This is the average sale price in that county that month in history, unadjusted for seasonality, unadjusted for inflation, just unadjusted. Because I understand it better when I see it unadjusted. I want you to understand it better also. So we saw the country, real estate boom, real estate correction, real estate recovery. And I want to point out, you see the heartbeats? High and low, high and low, right? Who wants to guess what that is? Let's go a free ebook. My CEO, Kevin Ortner, wrote a book called Rent the State Revolution, and I'm going to give a free ebook to A, anybody who asks a question, and B, uh, anybody who can answer this question right. Why do you think this is, a, why do prices go up and down, up and down, up and down, what seems like constantly throughout the last 20 years? Seasonality, check it out. June or July? February. July, February. Let's go up here. June, January. It's called winter and summer. It's called the spring market, right? Everybody knows the spring market exists, but there's like nobody in the industry that has ever run this chart until we did. And so nobody saw that. See, the reason why the market is busiest in this spring is that it's instinctual or instinctive. So this is an interesting observation, right? Just by virtue of visualizing data, you learn something, and that is that the prices are lower in the winter. Why are the prices lower? Because the demand is softer. Why is demand softer? Because everybody's trying to get their house hunting done in the spring when it's nice out. They want to get in the house in the summer and they want to be ready to go to school in August or September. Simple. Everyone knows it, but did you know the impact on median price? So for example, nationwide, the average price was 224 in June, but the prior February was 197. The following February was 211 or 206. Look at that. There is a $18,000, if I have my math right, swing from peak to trough just because of seasonality. 
So what does that mean? That means that right now, I've got cash set aside, I've got an investment thesis that I'm about to execute on, but I'm waiting until November to do it. I'm gonna load up in November because I can get a better price. Not because cheaper houses sell, but just fewer houses sell. So the sellers that accept offers in November or December, they really wanna get the deal done, so they accept a lower offer. The ones that really are willing to wait will hang on till the next spring and get a higher price. So you wind up, because there's supply and less demand, you wind up being able to find sellers that are willing to acquiesce in the negotiation, give you a better price. All right, so you just learned something today. That seasonality, whether you're buying to live in the house or buying to invest in it, you've got that covered. Hello, Patricia. Hey, Patricia, it's Greg Rand from Renner's Warehouse. How are you? Yes, hi, Greg. I'm doing fine, thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Hey, you got my uh, audio in the background, don't you? Oh, yeah, I'm going to move away from that. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm going to move away from that, sorry. Or you can mute it, but uh, either way, hey, thanks for uh, for letting us give you a ring. Uh, how are you today? Yeah, I'm doing just great. Taking some time off to watch the video, the live stream, and to get a little bit more information and an education on some options and opportunities to increase my portfolio, quite frankly. Awesome. So tell me about your portfolio and uh, what kind of question do you have? Okay. So uh, the question I did type in the Facebook box was um, about this. Uh, I own a property that we are renting out um, in Maryland, a DMV, and it, it, things are going pretty great. We've uh, been renting it out since December, and I would like to invest in other um, properties. I mean, you just mentioned in the, the live stream, November is a great month, so that's something to focus on. But I'm wondering <laughs> if getting uh, investors the way to go or just saving and outright purchasing with cash? Uh, like good cash question. Good question. Before I jump into that, let me just get a sense of, g give me the name of the county that you are currently invested in. Sure. Sure. It's in um, Howard County, Maryland. Howard County, Maryland. Got it. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to pull it up on the screen here. So we have that when, um, uh, as we talk about it. So, all right, so the first question was, do you bring on an investor or do you do it with all cash? Well, the other option, of course, is to use your cash as a down payment and get a mortgage. Um, hmm. When you say investor, do you mean somebody else to partner with you to put their own cash into? Um, well, I'm open to all ideas, but yeah, certainly like an investment group, because you mentioned uh, that you had investors in, in the homes that you purchased. Right. So we have. So we, we were actually on behalf of investors. So my first piece of advice is that whenever possible, yeah, whenever possible, um, own this stuff yourself. Okay. Like I've got property in New York that I bought with my brothers. Okay. And we love each other, but I can't get out because they don't want to. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm not going to make them. Yeah, yeah. So they still live there. I moved to North Carolina. And so like now, mm -hmm. forget it if it's perfect stranger. Actually, if it's a stranger, I might force them to sell. But um, the idea that if you have the ability to control your destiny by buying in your own account, I would do that. Uh, I'd rather bring on a lender than uh, an investor because the lender you can pay off and as long as you're paying the mortgage every month, they don't have any say as to what you do. Um, and if you have the ability to buy all cash, then the way that I do it is I put down 50%. Okay. All right, I like down payment. big fat down payment. Yeah, the reason I do that is okay. that um, it is like I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I take my risk in my business. And once I make a dollar, I'm not gonna lose it, okay? I just, I've never lost any money after I've earned it and I'm not gonna start now. So um, I put it into <laughs> rental property. And, um, but it's a little silly to not put any money down and do no mortgage because if you put down half, you still have a small payment. Your rent still mm -hmm. covers your payment by a long shot. Um, mm -hmm. But you're getting leverage, okay? So what happens is if I can buy, for example, right now, I'm buying two houses in an area of Charlotte. I have $400,000 to work with on that play. I could buy, um, I'm sorry, I have $200,000 to work with on that play, say. I could buy one house or I can get a 50% mortgage and buy two for 200 apiece. Oh, I see, okay. Right, so here's why that's beneficial. I can control 400 grand worth of real estate. So when the Charlotte market goes up, maybe 5% in the next 12 months, that's $400,000 worth of real estate going up 5%. So I made $20,000 in equity. And if I had only bought one house for 200 grand, I would have only made $10,000 in equity. So my income is going to be similar because now I have, a, I have more property paying rent, but I also have a mortgage payment to pay. 
But the difference is, is that my down payment allows me to control a bigger footprint of real estate so that as that elevates in value, I've got more real estate elevating in value, and so my equity builds faster. That's, that's great. I, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, that is a little risky, but at the same time, you put so much down that the payments are a little lower, and you have two properties you can get residual um, rental income from. Right, and then, you know, if you have two, and uh, a tenant goes vacant, so you have a month or two of no rent, which is not, not cool, um, but you also have a small mortgage, and so you're getting, you got two properties, you're getting rent on one, you have a little downtime on the other, the rent from one is probably gonna cover the mortgage on both, so you don't wind up coming into your pocket to make your mortgage payment. That's the reason why I don't do 25 or 30% down, because if I took that same 200 grand and bought three properties, the beauty of that is now I have $600,000 worth of real estate, and if that goes up 5%, I've now made $30,000 in equity, which is very attractive, but when I have vacancies, I have bigger mortgages now. And so a vacancy is definitely gonna be coming out of my pocket, which as I said before, is against my religion. <laughs> when it comes to money I've already made, I'm not putting any more in if I can help it. You know, repairs and maintenance for sure, but, um, but yeah, so uh, does that help? Um, yes, it really does. I guess one last question um, I have, I mean, this is very helpful, is, where are you getting the lenders? Because of course, for rental properties, at least in Maryland, the interest rates a little higher if it's not your primary residence. So, right. Um, right. Well, we actually—I forgot to mention that we have a new sponsor that we're going to be bringing on. We haven't signed the papers yet, but the Loan Depot. If you go to LoanDepot.com, they do. You're not going to be able to get the loan online the way you did if you were an owner occupant. But here's something that people don't always know because. Most lenders don't do this every day, but they have the program, they just don't know how to use it. You can use the home ownership mortgage for rental property. The rates are not quite as low as a home ownership mortgage. Maybe they're, I mean, I'm, I haven't checked in a couple of weeks, but you know, if the home ownership mortgage is four and a half, the rental mortgage is 4.9 or something, uh, but still ridiculously low. There's a limit on how many of those loans you can get, but it doesn't sound like you're approaching that limit yet. So what I would do is I would call around, go to LoanDepot.com, get a loan officer from there, talk to them, but then call around, talk to your real estate friends, call some local loan officer and ask them, do you do mortgages on rental property? And actually the question really is, have you done mortgages on rental property? Because you wouldn't mind having somebody who has experience in it, but find the person who has experience with it because those loan programs are gold um, mm -hmm. And then uh, you have a cheap mortgage, you get a 30-year fixed mortgage, and, and you're, you're in great shape. That is awesome. This is a very, um, very helpful. I thank you so much for letting me know about this. Okay, cool. Um, all right, hang on one second. Let's take a look at the, at the, at the chart here. Um, I don't know if you're back in front of your computer. I know you walked away no, because of the um, speaker. I walked away because it was so loud, and I didn't want it to uh, ring your ears. I'm walking back. Go back over. Yeah, just turn the volume down because I want to show everybody this. So this is Howard County. Um, where, what, what are some of the, the recognizable names inside of Howard? Sure. So Columbia, Maryland, and the car. Oh, oh, my gosh. I didn't even know I was on my Sorry. Um, Get the volume knob there. <laughs> so it's Columbia, Maryland is the, the, um, the, the closest city, like less than two miles away. And that was named one of the top five best places to live in the country. Awesome. Uh, a couple of years running, so I'm getting residual um, effects of living a town over, but living adjacent to Columbia. I love that. So that's why I plan to now, how far from, is this like in the D.C. metro suburbs or anything? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's actually right in the middle. It's not too far from Baltimore. We're probably about 12 miles from Baltimore, about 15, 20 miles from Washington, D.C., so it's a very specific location. Right, right in between the two okay. cities. I love that. I love that. That's actually a really important point. I'm glad you made it. So be I'll just make this one point is that Baltimore, people don't recognize Baltimore as being as great of, a, of an investment market as it is because the headlines on Baltimore are almost always negative. But Baltimore anchors DC to the north. So what happens is you got a major metro and then you got like a mega metro in DC and then you have a major metro just an hour or whatever north of it. Everything in between is in play. And so being right in between is great because you've got the ability for workers to commute in both directions, all right? And so you've got bedrock. And so let me show you this chart. This is the 20 years. You saw the blue line before. Okay. Now the blue line's been flattened out because the scaling of the chart changes as the state of Maryland kicks in, the black line, and then the county of Howard. So what this tells me is that Howard started out more expensive than the rest of the country back in the 90s. 
it did take off during the housing boom, but it didn't have that much of a housing bust. It kind of held on to all the gains that it made and it's kind of stayed level. But when I see that, what it tells me is a market, it's, there's only a few places in the country that actually have a chart like this where it went up, so big party, no hangover, right? It went way up and it held on, a little bit of a hangover, but not much, and held on to its value. DC does that, Charleston, South Carolina does that. There's very few other markets that didn't suffer any kind of a bust. And what I want people to realize is that when you have a market performing that way, think of this last 20 years as a stress test. You got to see how the market performed when things were going nuts. You got a chance to see how they performed when things were going bad and then how it recovered. And this market held strong and the averages are really impressive. Nationally, the average home in America appreciated 3.44% per year for the last 20 years. The state of Maryland, 5.22, which is a substantial increase, but look at this. The county of Howard, 6.42. That is one of the best appreciation rates in America. All right, so you're a genius. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> yeah, and I would, listen, at the end of the day, if you could accumulate more, I don't think, if this market did this over the last 10 or 12 years, it's hard to imagine anything on the horizon that would take it down. Right? If it was going to get taken down, it would have gotten taken down back here. It didn't get taken down. And then again, look at, look at, the, uh, look at the, the seasonality. You've got July, and it went from 408 in July of 2016 down to 347. So a $50,000 swing. Back up again, back down again. So this is, you know, definitely if it were me, I would bide my time, take my time, do my research on what what blocks I want to invest in, what parts of town. Are there any rail stations up there that are like people taking trains down to DC? Uh, what they have is a uh, park and ride. So there are public buses and um, chartered buses. Okay. So there's no uh, train station in that specific area, but adjacently, um, yeah, people do drive, to park their car, okay. to train station. Okay, good. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. It's okay, so yeah, I just look for stuff like that. I look for anything that I can find that, okay, now I found a winning market. Is there, like, I get greedy when it comes to, I mean, 6.42% appreciation rate, it's almost silly to get more greedy than that, but can you find a part of town that's gentrifying? Can you find a part of town that just got a Starbucks walkable? I don't know. Find some other little edge if you can. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Get ready to pounce. Make offers on seven or eight houses in the same weekend in November. Get the best deal you can, and you'll uh, you'll win. Well, I I uh, definitely look forward to being a genius like you and my <laughs> uh, very strategic efforts to build my portfolio. Excellent advice. Well, I appreciate that. And by the way, I don't have any markets where I'm getting six point four two percent. So I think we know who the genius <laughs> is on this call. Thank you very much. I appreciate you jumping Thank on the phone with us. Much. All right, see you. Appreciate having this day. Bye. All right, so that's kind of neat, right? This is a market I had not heard of, Howard County. Um, and uh, right away, a person who lives there and invests there learned something because she was able to visualize data that is free. Okay, I forgot to mention that. The Research Center, everything on renderswarehouse.com, Investor Marketplace is free. We make our money when you buy and sell property with us or when you let us manage your property for you. So we give away everything we know. We give away all this really expensive data, like really expensive data because we monetize the relationship when we help you achieve your goals. Hello. Hey Paul, it's Greg Rand from Renner's Warehouse. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for putting your phone number in. What, uh, what's your question? My question was, uh, bought, we bought two homes in Chicago uh, at the end of 2016, and everything was going great, and then the uh, property tax went basically doubled. And so my question is, should we wait it out or should I just, it, it went from, you know, double digit, you know, cash on cash to, you know, break even or one <laughs> and the other one, you know, 150 bucks or so. But yeah, that's a good I, question. I my question is, yeah, okay. I'm sorry, let me, I'll let you finish. So, you know, is there, is there any chance for upside, you know, to the, uh, the selling point for Chicago was it was the last big city that never came, never rebounded from the from the uh, crash in 2007-8. And so it was like, okay, it was bound to come up, and it never really did. 
So that, I guess that's my question. Is there any upside or? Yeah, you know what? I'll tell you, it's unfortunate um, when some of these governments spoil a housing market. So um, if yeah. you've gone from a positive to a break even and you're down to 150 bucks, here's my concern is that they're not going to stop now. You know, you're correct that Chicago was the, the only city of the big three or four major mega metros in America where you could make a yield. Okay, like New York, mm-hmm. California, New York, L.A., that, that, that ship sailed. But Chicago, you could. But, you know, the mentality of governments in these big, cent- these big uh, cities tends to be that, you know, they've got more bills than they can pay, and so they just keep shaking down the productive people for more taxes. Like just today, like an, literally an hour ago, I was buying lunch. The headline in the newspaper here in Charlotte was the city council or whoever proposes new budget, $2 billion budget, uh-huh. raising taxes on all property owners. And I read the subhead, and it was, Teachers' uh, compensation, um, low-income housing uh, were proposed, and taxes are being raised across the board. And it's a bummer because, you know, at the end of the day, people do have the ability to leave, just like I think maybe you should. You know, if you liquidated your properties in Chicago, I look at that as it isn't as if they're ever satiated, right? Like every one right. of these governments, they take and then they go, well, we'll take more. What are they going to do? You know, what's anybody going to do? Well, they have no choice. They stay. And the truth is most people do stay. But there are places around the country where they run a surplus, <clears throat> where they don't spend all the money. And you can trade that property in, take the ride you've been on. You know, when did you buy that property? Uh, at the end of 2016. 16. Okay. So you made some money on that, right? It, it, it was okay, you know. It was, we we have eight other homes in Ohio that were, you know, what I call steady Eddie. They, they don't appreciate much, but they they cash flow really nice. But we bought those in 2012. So I thought, you know, I I thought, well, I'll, I'll diversify a little bit. And uh, 2016, you know, it looked pretty good. Blah blah blah. But so now I'm going, okay, well, I I want to move to, you know. Some of the recommended, you know, places are like warmer climate. So I thought I'll take a, I'll take a little bit of a loss if I sold it now, but um, I just don't see the upside. You know. Yeah, I don't blame you. Tell me where, where are you in Ohio? Where, where do you own in Ohio? Uh, we're in uh, 22 miles from Cincinnati, in between that and Dayton. Small town called uh, Middletown. What county is that in? Trenton. What county is that in, Paul? Uh, that is in Butler County. Butler. Our database is based upon uh, county at this point. So I'm just pulling Butler County up on the screen here to take a look at what you've yeah. got going there. So, yeah, you're right. The, the property that, values. At yeah, that time, uh, I was really you know, getting ready to retire. Uh-huh. And I wanted cash flow, and I didn't care about appreciation. And now I don't know if I'm getting greedy or not. No, not at all. <laughs> no, I like it. So here's, so here's, I'll give you a little tip here that maybe you find valuable. So... You're right, okay? Um, across the country, there is a, no matter where you go, there's an interplay between yield, the profit you make on the rents, as you know, and the appreciation rate. They kind of go together for because they're connected, right? So in Ohio, you're looking at this, and Ohio as a state appreciated 1.4% over the last 20 years, where the country was 3.4%. So it's, it's half of the country, and the county of Butler is a little better than that at one8 Um and so because, precisely because the property values haven't gone up, but the rents tend to go up because tenants outbid each other for a rental, because there's usually a little bit of a shortage of rentals, so the yield climbs, but the appreciation doesn't. And so in a lot of places in Cincinnati, for example, in Dayton, we see that market making its way to like a 95 to 10% ROI, and that's made up of like an 8% yield or a 7.5% yield and a 2% appreciation rate. Right, so it goes like eight and two. That's how you get to 10. A minute ago we were talking about um, a Maryland suburb where the appreciation rate is six, but I would venture a guess that she's only doing, if she bought today, she'd be getting a four in her yield. So she makes her way to 10. If you go to where I live in Charlotte, it's like a six and a four. You go to Dallas, it's like a five and a five, right? It always seems to wind up ending at a 10 because of the interplay of price appreciation and yield. So we had a client, Paul, recently, who is a pretty sizable one, who's got like 100 million bucks, not a person, a fund, who wants to invest. And they were asking, 
Should we do what all the other big guys do and go to Atlanta and Dallas and Orlando and Nashville and Phoenix? And I say, well, maybe, but if you want to be next generation and think this through a little bit, you want to get yourself to a 10% ROI, but you could do Cincinnati and Austin. All right? And they said, huh, interesting, because Cincinnati is a low appreciation rate, high yield. Austin is a high appreciation rate, low yield. And so you kind of balance yourself out. You end up in the middle, but you're playing two different trends. You've got Bedrock Midwest in Cincinnati, and you've got you know a cool, hip, weird town down in, they call, they call themselves weird, in Austin, you know, the, the, the yeah. hipster city in the middle of Texas. So you're able to play two different mega trends. And like, we're, we're a national property management company, so we're able to help people do that where they can buy in two different places, have one point of contact for the management. Um, and so I, what I would encourage you to do is go to the research center, renderswarehouse.com slash research, and uh, mm-hmm. play around with different markets and think about the idea of blending your portfolio You've got some high yield, low appreciation. Maybe you look at DC or Raleigh or Charleston or Austin or Nashville where the yields are relatively low, but the appreciation is off the charts and kind of mix your portfolio that way. No, that sounds great. That sounds like a plan. Cool. Anything else? No, that'll do it. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Take it easy, buddy. Okay, cool. We got Tim Herridge calling in. We'll see if Tim agrees with me or not, because if he doesn't, he'll say so. Tim is the uh, the CEO of a number of companies. I've known him in the industry for a long time. Hello, Tim. What's up, Tim? It's Greg. This is Greg. It is. How you doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. I was just telling everybody that I think the first time you and I met, we were both in, the, in an audience at the same session, and neither one of us agreed with the speaker, but you stood up and told him so. And then kind of took over the session after that from the from the back row. Well, well I mean that's not my intention here. Uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> no, I just I uh, I was digging what you were saying. And then I, I made that comment on Noel's chat that I didn't agree with fifty percent leverage. I said leverage based on cash flow, and he said, "Well, call and give your two cents." Good. Okay. So so you don't agree with fifty percent leverage, which means on the first call, or I I told her don't. Put all cash down, but put down fifty percent to be um, to be sort of real super conservative. You don't agree? Why? I mean, to me, if you're buying the property as uh, as, as an investment to derive income, you should factor the income and really finance based off of DSCR, uh, the debt service coverage ratio, because there could be times with certain properties that you may need to put more than fifty percent down. There could be properties that you know, a, a, a 70, 80 percent leverage could be OK. So you uh, so to, to describe DS, the, the debt service coverage ratio is the ratio of the rents against what your debt service is. And what number do you look for? Yeah, I try to finance, you know, so a lender will give you about one point one to one point <laughs> two is really kind of the, 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 the lowest they'll go. So they want to say after your maintenance, your management, your repairs, your taxes and your insurance, basically, you know, and your any HOAs. So kind of all those fixed costs with operating a, uh, a rental property, they'll loan you where your principal and interest has to be, you, your net income has to be 1.1 <coughs> or 1.2 times the principal and interest. Right, so, so just, that, that, go ahead. No, so that's not a very big margin, though. So if we just do the math on this thing and it winds up that it's 500 bucks a month, is, you know, you're getting $1,000 a month, you're paying all those expenses, you end up with $600 a month in income. They'll go 1.2, let's say, on the more conservative one. So they're saying that they want uh, $720 in, um, no, they want, they want the $600 to be 1.2% of what they're willing to spend, which is roughly, they'll give you a mortgage payment of 500 bucks on a, uh, income of six hundred a month. That's right. Okay. That's right. Because they want, they want, they want. They, they, it, it's almost the same underwriting as if you were qualifying for a personal mortgage. Right. Right. They want to make sure that the income that you know you're working with, which is in this case the rental income, can pay for the debt that you're asking for. Uh, and, and so, kind of the way we look at it now is. And I used to be an LTV buyer, right? If I could get it a certain LT loan to value, I would buy. But now 
I'm really trying to be smart, smarter than I used to be, I should say, and focus on, on, on really making sure that the cash flow from that property is going to be able to pay for that property. Yeah, no doubt. And so t tell everybody how many houses back of the napkin you have bought in your career, Tim. 1,500 or so. Okay. That's the reason why I told people 50% down because you're, you know, the, the level of sophistication that you've got going on with that many transactions is I wouldn't recommend you be 50% down. I recommend that you have your own strategy, but we're actually, this, this is actually, as you know, um, we're, pre we're presenting ourselves as something between a real estate company and a wealth management company. Some place, the intersection of Charles Schwab and Remax, right? So it's real estate we're in, but we're, we're helping everyday people. Uh, we also want to help pros like you, but the larger part of the market we're trying to activate are everyday people who maybe own none and are going to buy their first, or they own two or three, they want to buy five. And so I'm giving ultra conservative advice because um, I don't want anybody coming after me. <laughs> so we make it like really, really simple. You know, I wish I had had better advice before the first recession, right? Because we found ourselves way over leveraged based off the cash flow of the properties. And, you know, we had some interest rates adjust and the cash flow wasn't able to absorb the rate adjustment. And I think that, you know, my thing is, is they ought to get really good advice. And from, from you guys, and you know, you guys have brought on a lot of different <coughs> services. And I, I think learning to to forecast your cash flow is is probably the key missing component in the real estate investment marketplace. People, you know, well, as you know, Greg, when you talk to a landlord in Atlanta, they run their numbers differently than a landlord in Baltimore, and the landlord in Chicago runs it different on the north side versus the, the south side of Chicago. Right. And you know, understand trying to really understand a good net operating income, I think will tell you a lot about how much money you should put down. Because it could be more, it could be less, and uh, it may actually be a very bad, uh, uh, great example, I bought a house for 50% of its value last week in Allen, Texas, that I would have had to put another 50% down on to make it a good rental property. Interesting. Right? So that would have been a 75% of value down payment because the rental rate in that area were basically non-existent. Right, and so that's one of the reasons why I also don't recommend that people who are relatively new at this get involved in buying things, or even, I'll rephrase, don't even look for deals. Don't even worry about deals, right? Like I don't, my view of, um, of the smartest way to do this if you are not attending to it as a full-time job the way you are, is to basically take a much simpler accumulation play um, and uh, buy things that are in as perfect condition as possible. I'm not sure if you heard of my joke, but it's not even a joke that when I change a baby, I get uh, chafed because my hands are so soft. You're, you don't. You're, you've had your hands on a hammer before. I haven't. I'm not sure which, which end do you hold the hammer. Is it this end over here? I, I forget how these work. Um, it depends if you're left or right handed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm showing right now on the investor marketplace, our renter's warehouse, we have this calculator. And we have the pleasure, you know, I've been showing the charts of price appreciation, which almost nobody knows what the price appreciation rates are. I have no way of measuring it. We do. We're giving that away. We also have this calculator, and we're trying to help set a standard of a responsible way so that you're right. The guy in Atlanta, the guy in D.C. or Baltimore, they do it different ways, but there is a way to do it, and it's the institutional way is the one that we have always been involved in. So we're putting these calculators out so you can put in that information see the way it changes your yield and your cash on cash. We have a mortgage modeler on there that you can play around with different assumptions and watch the way the mortgage modeling changes your equity and your cash flow going forward. So we're trying to create as many free tools as we can so that people can get from like first base to second or second to third um, on their real estate investment strategy and maybe someday get real sophisticated and then, uh, you know, uh, then start doing some of the more stuff like you do. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was during the recession, we had to owner finance some of those houses that we were over leveraged in just to get out of them. And now you look 10 years later, and we literally gave up millions of equity gain from the appreciation. And, you know, so one of the things that my wife and I do now that I, I tell people to do is the exact same thing you said. 
buy for quality, not for deal, right? Buy the house that's been there for 50 years and has never had foundation work in Dallas right. because it's on, a, it's on good soil and has good drainage. Don't buy the house that is a pile of rubble, but hey, you can save 10%. Because at the end of the day, typically those interior yep. lots, those nicer houses, they're going to appreciate more consistently. I won't say more, but more consistently. Right. And, and you'll have less maintenance. You'll have less vacancy. You'll attract better tenants. And all of that just leads to more consistent cash flow, which for me, my rental portfolio is my part-time gig, right? It's my retirement. And uh, my flipping is my active day in stuff. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, talking to the folks at Renters Warehouse is one of those things that I do all the time to find out what the vacancy percentages are running, what the maintenance percentages are running. Right. What the, what what are the what are the real turnover costs looking like these days? What do you think I can get on rent on this house? What do you think it would go up in appreciation? Because those are the real drivers towards whether you want to buy the house or not. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's nice of you to say that you've got your finger on the pulse, but getting an opinion from a renters warehouse person is also good because they do have um, they don't run their own business necessarily only, but they actually have their hand in a lot of other people. Um, and, and what their strategies are. And, and we really keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening so that we give good, solid advice and that people, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And I know you, you get this because you had 2020 REI, which you taught a lot of investors in a seminar style uh, venue on how to secure financial abundance with real estate. And I know you must get emails and phone calls on occasion, maybe even pretty regularly with people who are saying, Hey, Tim, thank you. I took your class in 2011 or whatever. I took your advice. You, do you get some of those? Oh, yeah. I mean, because uh, yeah, I think you have to find someone that can give you advice from a position of experience and not theory. Right. And, you know, that's why I make it a point to reach out to folks like you. And, well, I mean, last month I sent you a guy that called me and had a couple hundred houses in Dallas to sell. And I can't give him advice about that. I've never done that. And, but I know people that can. So I think you have to really focus more on experience than theory. And, you know, so the reason I say call someone like Renner's Warehouse for advice on property management numbers is, I mean, there's not a whole lot of other people that manage 22,000 houses, right? Right. <laughs> right. Hey, that's cool. Hey, listen, tell everybody about your blog, this business and barbecue. What are you doing? I'm partially retired at the age of 40, bro. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I just, I, I think, you know, I've worked really hard and I've been really successful and I'm really just trying to focus on helping people run their small businesses, their entrepreneurial ventures. And, you know, to me, the barbecue aspect is not because I'm like really knowledgeable at barbecue. It's, it's something I enjoy to eat. <laughs> and I never took time for it before because I was too busy. And so now, I'm enjoying life a little bit more, taking more time for the things you know that I want most, and it's just it's, it's, it's about perspective, right? It's a big metaphor. Awesome. Well, I've been enjoying it. The and podcast. Dallas, give me a call, and I'm going to take you to eat barbecue and have you on the podcast. That sounds awesome. The podcast is is uh, business and barbecue. Is that what it's called with Tim Herridge? Yeah, bu yeah, business and barbecue. You can find it on all the major places. Awesome. It's fun stuff. I've been enjoying it. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thanks for calling. Take it easy, bud. All right. We got one more? Yeah, no number, but... It's no phone good. number? Okay, cool. So I'm going to do this one the old-fashioned way. Alexander, um, I'm trying to buy my first investment property. I'm located in Miami-Dade County. Properties are expensive here, and too many properties are on the market. The signs lean towards prices coming down due to lack of buyers. Should I wait? Should I wait, he says. What would be the best strategy to buying homes away from my state? Are there certain tax laws that I should look out for, any cities we should stay away from? All right, great question, Alexander. Uh, first of all, um, if you're finding a problem in Miami, I have not heard of that. What I will tell you though, is I wouldn't change states, I would change towns in, uh, in South Florida. Um, there is so much to like about Florida. I'm looking at this chart right here. This is actually a really kind of an interesting one for everyone to see. You can see that the, uh, the, the housing boom, the blue line was pretty mild for the country when you compare it to the state of Florida, the black line, and then this crazy green line, which is Miami-Dade. So you can see big, it all started at the, around the same price. So this, the prices were around $100,000 or just shy. 
back in 96. Started out at the same price down here, just sub 100, but the country peaked at 190 and Miami-Dade peaked at 300, right? So, and then look at this cliff, down it comes. <clears throat> so you've got this massive fall off. What happened in Miami at that time was not just what happened everywhere else, but Miami went crazy developing new luxury real estate. So at this moment in Miami, I remember being down there visiting my brother who was going to University of Miami, uh, his graduation weekend, I'm looking out the window of my hotel, I counted 23 cranes. There was only like 11 sky uh, high rises, 11 skyscrapers in the skyline, but there were 23 cranes. So the skyline was more than doubling. That was right around here. And then down it came and it came down pretty sharply. It stayed down. It's been fighting its way back, but it sounds like Alexander is starting to see signs of over accumulation of supply. Too many signs. I'm sorry, he said signs leaning towards prices coming down. He says properties are expensive here and too many are on the market. So if you're seeing inventory collecting, what you're seeing is an indication that, see this chart right here? Look what happened most recently, okay? It spiked up here. I think it's probably gonna mellow out. I think the trend line for Miami is just follow my pointer. It started back here. You cut the peak in the trough in half, right here. You carry it forward this way, you're too high in Miami. So yes, I would consider waiting or I would consider going west. Go west, young man. <laughs> Fort Myers, Florida. Okay, Lee County. Some things on the Gulf Coast north of Tampa. Things on the Atlantic Coast north of Daytona Beach on the way to Jacksonville. Or you look at some of these bigger cities that are not bedroom communities, like Miami is an international city that has the benefit in good times of massive amounts of international investment, but sometimes too much. Too much capital, it drives things up artificially. Um, Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, those three cities are much more akin to Charlotte and Atlanta than they are Naples, Boca Raton, and Miami. Miami International, Boca Raton and Naples, bedroom communities for snowbirds, and then Jacksonville, Tampa, and Orlando are just big southern cities. The average age in those cities is under 35. Their industry is real. They're driven by universities. They're driven by commerce. And so you can get a nice solid yield in those places. You're not going to see the roller coaster. Like, for example, let me show you Orange County, California, which is Orlando. Now let's go to Orange County, Florida, and you'll see the green line there. It's still pretty steep on the way up and down. Here it comes. Okay, kind of, you know, actually it's pretty similar, but that trend line hasn't really caught up yet. It's kind of right there. I'm not sure I trust this last blip. We just, by the way, uh, big disclaimer, we just released this research center and we have a whole new data set in there and we're trying to figure out if we believe these spikes in 2018 because I'm not sure I do. I don't see evidence of that. So this might be an artificial spike. So I'm going to ignore that and show you that the line kind of cuts across here. If I go to, I think it's Duval County is where Jacksonville is. All right, so look at the green line here. Now, Jacksonville was, is very much like Charlotte in that it is not, it's kind of like, it's in Florida, but it's not like the rest of Florida. It's just a, a, a city on the water. And so they had a boom, but not as high. See, the black line is Florida. So it, didn't, it wasn't as volatile as the rest of Florida, Jacksonville, right? It didn't go up as high. It came down to a similar point and it hasn't gone as crazy since. So if you take that beginning, carry the line, split peak and trough, carry it forward, you're right kind of about there. And so I'd stay in Florida, and the reason is is that Florida, you asked about are there tax laws you should be aware of. Well, the tax law you should be aware of is, is that there is no state income tax in Florida, which is why you stay there. All right, population is migrating into Florida from everywhere in the country, especially the big population centers up in the Northeast. It's not slowing down. When the economy is good, people move to Florida. When the economy is bad, people move to Florida. All right, the quality of life, cost of living, the coastline, it's got more coastline than any state, except maybe Michigan, which people don't know. But long story short, um, if Florida, places like Miami, go through some pain in the near term, wait for it to bottom out and then double down. Uh, but still, my in instinct would be, it's a five hour drive to get to Jacksonville. It's not too far out of reach. Take a look at some of those other pockets around. I mentioned Lee County. One last thing I'll do. This is where Fort Myers is. All right, so Lee County, intro, look at this, okay. Big boom, big crash, deeper than the rest of Florida, and then fighting its way back. 
So if I go at the beginning, cut the peak and trough, carry it forward, I see this as being a market that this line, this green line, this, this gradual uptrend is something you can kind of depend on, not staying quite as steep, but leveling off, but I don't see any bubble at all in Lee County. All right, hope that helps. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you for being in here. Please share this with your friends if you found it valuable or motivating or really stupid and you wanna make fun of me, that's okay too, as long as we get to share. We're here every Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. We call it Picking Winners Live on the Renters Warehouse page. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you again. So that was episode three of Picking Winners Live on the Renters Warehouse page on Facebook. We had a good set of calls uh, from all around the country. Um, we had Tim Herridge, an old friend who called in and gave some expert advice. And uh, this is fun. We're going to keep doing it. Hope to see you next time.